don't know Mr. Bassett, um, he is a recent board member of the period for VHS. He is a current adjunct professor at Massasoit. Um, his interests lie in alchemy and science, especially in relation to colonial America. Um, he has worked with chemicals and pharmaceuticals, um, thank you. Um, he has a BS in biochemistry from the University of Maine, MS in chemistry from Northern University, and an ALM in history of science from Harvard. Um, so he's worked in biotechnology and chemical industries for quite a while. Um, as I mentioned, he's now working at, at Massasoit, and he's been on our board for a while, um, and a welcome addition he has been to OBHS. Um, alchemy is one of the classes he teaches occasionally at Massasoit. Um, happens to be one of his interests. And luckily, he gets, he gets to share it with us, which I'm very thankful for. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Bassett to entertain us for a little while. Okay. Thank you, Shelley, and thank you to the Oak Ridge Water Historical Society for inviting me to do this talk. And uh, thank you to the West Ridge Water Local Access folks for filming this and taking it. Uh, this the introduction of a Cromwell's copy of Glauber's New Philosophical Furnaces, and we'll explain that title. My own background is uh, I put in a career in chemistry, working in, as Shelley said, pharmaceutical and biotechnology companies, but all the way down to paints and adhesives and environmental chemistry and clinical chemistry, and shopped it around in a whole bunch of stuff. It, uh, it is true that I started my working career watching paint dry. And um, it's harder than you think. And that has led me all the way to here today. Uh, my general interest uh, in, chem in history built up separately from working in chemistry. My, uh, that led to this hobby in the history of chemistry, looking at early chemistry, alchemy, Chemistry, which is a uh, transitional state that's in there, and in particular the relationship between natural philosophy, religion, and the sciences and all that. My uh, children claim that this interest developed because my college textbooks got old enough that they were no longer current and modern and useful, so I had to start using them as historic references. Uh, mostly what I look at is matter theory and how that affects the way you look at the world around you and how you interact with it. Some of the terms that, that stem from this field are the philosophical elaboratory or the laboratorium. These are the root words to what we now call a laboratory. And the philosophical furnace, which is uh, the root of the title to the book that we're going to talk about tonight. Philosophical furnace is basically a silversmith, goldsmith, blacksmith furnace scaled down for what we might today call research purposes that they used in these early uh, alchemical works in the 14, 15, 1600s. And the new philosophical furnace that Glauber talks about is a, what we would recognize today as a still. So it gets into all kinds of uh, distillation spirits and things like that. So who is Glauber and why should I care? <laughs> this is a sketch of the man himself, Johann Rudolf Glauber, who lived in the 1600s, born in Bavaria, which was, as we all know, a hotbed of alchemy in the 1600s. He uh, spent most of his working life down in Amsterdam which was uh, a place of big academic interest, lots of work going on in the universities there, in the Low Countries in general. He was employed as an alchemist. That was his title for himself. Uh, we don't think of this much as a title today. The uh, practice that he did was something close to what we would call pharmacy today. And in fact, in uh, the UK, pharmacists are still called chemists. He uh, did publish this one book um, in 1646, The New Philosophical Furnaces. 
which was translated in 1652 into English, and that's what we're going to talk about, is this English translation, and in particular, one copy of the book as an artifact. The background for this book is uh, in my collection of old chemistry and alchemy books. Uh, I like the 17th century. It's just modern enough. It's tied into the whole enterprise of uh, world exploration and colonial expansion. And at that time of my life, I was still working at a highly paid uh, position and had too much money, so I had to spend it somehow, as we all know. And I found on a search, offered for sale. A description of new philosophical furnaces, or new, oh, 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 oh. this is all the stuff that I was looking for. I was looking for this book by Glauber. But this came up with, together with documents relating to Oliver Cromwell's copy of Glauber's Philosophical Furnaces. And in the search, I was searching for Glauber as the author, but this came up with Oliver Cromwell as the co author. Now, I know that Oliver Cromwell is not the co-author of this book. This got me interested. Oliver Cromwell, as you may remember, is uh, an army man, Don Political, in the UK. Author of the New Model Army, put that thing together during the English Civil War. Was uh, instrumental in the execution of Charles I. This is the bottom of the death warrant for Charles I. There's Oliver Cromwell's signature. This is a poor representation of a painting of Cromwell. In 1653, he becomes the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, the Puritan renovated government for uh, what would otherwise be known as the United Kingdom. This, these dates become really important as we talk about this particular book. And he died in 1658. Shortly after he died, it was the end of the Commonwealth and the Restoration and all that other stuff. All that political history that you're familiar with from your European history and uh, early history of the period. Lauder's New Philosophical Furnaces. The publication date for the English edition is 1652 officially. This is uh, listed in multiple sources as Oliver Cromwell's copy, forged, maybe, or not. We're not sure. Uh, this is the book itself. Comes in a nice, beautiful Morocco uh, slip case. And it comes together with this other little notebook, documents relating to Oliver Cromwell's copy of Tom Glover's Bible. Irresistible to me. So, I decided to buy it. I was looking for a copy of the New Philosophical Furnaces anyway. This claimed to be a forgery. It had documents related to it. They warned me there's all sorts of stains and marks and notes in the margins and heavily underlined, and that's just what I like. <laughs> I want to see a working copy that somebody had in the lab and that they used. That's what I'm looking for. This is one of the title pages, one of the first pages, it's the A2 page. Here's one of the signatures with a date, 1653. There's some marginalia here. Uh, it was really kind of funny. I put in the order for this, and I got an email back saying, you might want to call me and talk about this first. So I called the guy up, and he walked me through, and he said, and he hemmed and hawed, and I tried to talk him down on the price, but he was pretty fixed about the price. That wasn't going to change. He just wanted me to know that he was selling me a forgery and that he was taking no responsibility for it. I said, okay, I, I got that, I got that. But it's heavily damaged and fixed. Yeah, 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 I got that, I got that. And it's stained. Yeah, 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 I got that. The book itself, as I said, it's got a nice uh, rebound cover, which looks like it's from about the mid 1800s. It's not an original 1600, 1652 binding. The title page, most of the pages look like they're from about the 1600s. You can tell from the page, the paper content, the way that the uh, 
ink is pressed into the paper and all of that. Some pages are tipped in, there have been some repairs. You can see on this title page, this has a ragged edge, there's some breaks here on the corners, but this page has some other questions around it. One of the questions is the list date here is 1651, one year ahead of the official publication date. That has to be explained. The sales pitch says, some of the pages are trimmed, some margins are lost, but all the text is intact. Yes, indeed, there's some trimming, there's some margins lost. I'm not so much worried about that. I am looking for the text. Um, it's the 1652, blah, 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 blah. But it's got this 1651 date on the beginning at the preface. That could be a little bit problematic. The thing is filled with marginalia, notes, stains. There's some worming. Okay. I said, okay, I sent him the money, he sent me the book. Tipped in pages. A tipped in page is when there's usually it's because there's been some publisher's error in the binding. And there's a page that's been left out. And what you do is you go to the place where the page should be and carefully glue in one new page. Now this is from the back of the book. This is the last page of the book. And there's another Cromwell signature for you. It says it's the end of the book. You can see that this page and this page look different. The paper is different. The um, fonts are different. The ink is different. Just about everything about this page is different from this page. Also, there's this shadow here from where this originally was contacting another page, and this doesn't fit. If you turn this page, this is the back of the tipped in page. Here's an even bigger hint that this is not part of the original book. Other books printed to be sold by the same publisher, the same printer, in London, blah, 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 blah. And then it lists a bunch of books, all of which were published after 1652. So this page alone had to come from a later edition. Marginalia. This is my favorite marginalia in the whole book. Whoever did this was looking at this illustration and reading the text that goes along with it and saying, how the hell do I build one of these? And they're trying to figure it out because it doesn't, this illustration doesn't quite match the text. There's some possible confusion about how do you build this thing? Where does the fuel go? How does the air get in there? How is it ventilated? That's what this person is trying to figure out here. This piece, this marginalia, I believe was probably drawn by somebody really using this as a textbook and trying to do these operations. Second hint that this was really used, uh, here are some real fingerprints, real fingerprints. I don't know whose, um, but they're smudgy fingerprints. And this stuff is the kind of goop that was used to seal glass joints before we had good close-fitting glass joints. This is based on my chemical background in adhesives and looking at this, this looks pretty damn old. I can't wait to have the opportunity to sacrifice some little small part of that and submit it to chemical analysis, but I haven't had access to the right equipment yet. Marginalia. Through large parts of the book, it's underlined. And it's not all underlined the way many of my students now highlight entire pages in their textbook. These are just declaring the important parts of an operation and what you should see if you do the operation correctly. Some other marginalia down here. It does acquire a fair golden yellowness or a reddish of color as if they were covered with gold. I'm talking about some real operation this has to happen. The other thing to notice here on this page, somebody wrote something, I haven't quite been able to decipher what it is, that some other right owner, maybe the same person at a later date, tried to obliterate that writing. Somebody's been using this book, probably more than one person. Worming. Well, we've all heard about bookworms. 
These are the traces of real bookworms. They're little insect larvae that get into the book, and they eat their way through the pages. Here is a typical example. Worm comes out here, does this, goes back in here. Those go back and forth. This is like a three-dimensional contour map going through the pages of the book. These go through almost every page of the book. Here's wormholes coming out here, but they don't go through this page. You turn the page, and they go back in here. This is another example of a tipped-in page. This page has been replaced with a page from a later edition. This paper and this ink look a lot like the paper and the ink in that last page that we know was added after 1652 because it listed those books that were printed later. So this is a tipped-in page. Here's another example. This is the tipped in page. In this one, I've put a piece of red paper in back of this so you can see that these are the wormholes here. Here's some repair work that's been done by somebody that knows how to do a library repair. Uh, there is high quality tape holding this page together. Uh, the worm comes out here, disappears for a page, and goes back in over here. So we know that this is a later page. And that this is another example of some, um, number one, some damage that spanned these pages, probably damaged the page that originally was here. And number two, these have been repaired in the same manner and probably at the same time. Heritage. Well, there was that other little book, documents relating to Oliver Cromwell's copy of this book. Uh, this book in particular, most of the pages seem to be from the first edition of Glauber's translated text. It was, we know that it was offered for sale in 1876 because we have the advertisement flyer for the auction house that offered it in 1876. It also, this also makes reference to two letters from 1876 from a couple of these guys that were historians and prairians of the time, both of them say, oh yeah, this is good stuff. This is Oliver Cromwell's copy. They authenticate it. Note the date is 1876, not 1676. There's some, some work has to go into this. It, um, the sale was advertised heavily in the American Bibliopolis. If that isn't the best title for a magazine, I don't know what it is. And in this Northamptonshire Notes and Queries, most of what they were interested in is this representation of a map, which claims to be in Oliver Cromwell's hand, and it claims to be the map of the Battle of Masby, which was the pivotal battle of the uh, English Civil War. One of those letters, the Swanson letter, is uh, this is the entire letter. It's on one page. There's the date, 1876, May, blah, 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 blah. It says, yep, this is really Oliver Cromwell's signature. I'm sure of it. This is the Bambam letter. Notice the papers are different. The ink is different. The signatures are different. It's a different penmanship. This is worked over a lot more heavily than this quick note was. This guy goes on for eight pages like this. He's quite serious about how certain he is that this is Oliver Cromwell's copy. Here's one of the things that that depends on. This is the image that we had before. Uh, the top part is the bottom part of the death warrant for King Charles I. And here is Oliver Cromwell's official signature and stamp on the death line. Here are the signatures. These are three different signatures that are contained in this book in different places. And this one has the date 1653. The two guys that wrote these letters compared this signature with this signature and say, yeah, that looks pretty much the same. 
There's also some marginalia text in there that claims to be by Oliver Cromwell. It's not signed, you'll notice, but in the margin of this page, written sideways, is this, oh, may the Lord help me in my pious undertaking by the Most High, I will cut him off root and branch. This, in the 1876 letters, this is claimed to be Oliver Cromwell in 1653 plotting for the execution of Charles I and the elimination of the royal family. That's the root and branch. The marginalia goes on on a completely different page. This is one of the signatures. This is the battle plan for the Battle of Nazareth. We'll come back to that in a minute. And above it, there's a bunch of text. The text here says, I'd say Blomber is an errant knave, and I do bethink me, he speaketh of wonders which he cannot be accomplished. Nevertheless, it is lawful for a man to this endeavor. Curious. You read that. And my first thought is, why the hell would he write that here? But you have to do that for both of them. And then this is a bigger picture of that same map. It claims to be the battle plan for the Battle of Nazareth, June 14, 1645. It's not a very good map of the battle. We've looked at the battle plans from both sides. This isn't a great representation of it. So this draws some questions to its authenticity, but who knows? We're not really sure, at least at this point. So let's look at this marginal text. On page 228, verse of back by the part, we have this statement. I'd say Clover is an errant maid. I want to focus on this line right here. Wonders which cannot be accomplished. What is he referring to? Well, possibly what he's referring to is in the dedication of this book by the editor and translator, J.F., this philosophical treatise, being frequently and profoundly read, meaning you have to practice it, may be able to make not only all of the poor of your country rich, but all of the sick healthy. That's quite a claim. This is just after this comment. This may be referring to this claim. Notice that this claim is being made by the translator, not by the author. Set forth in English by J.F. D.M., Doctor of Medicine. So, Glauber is working in Bavaria, or from Bavaria, working in Amsterdam. Notice he's in Amsterdam up to 1649, and he bolts back to Bavaria because of the wars, and comes back in 1655. John French is largely recognized as being the translator of J.F. His name never appears in this, but many, many authors have recognized that he's the translator. He also claims it in some of his later books that this is a book by him, but what he means is it's a book translated by him because he always gives Glover credit. We do know very little about this John French, but what we do know is that he served in the English army, and he seems to have served at a time that may have overlapped with Cromwell's early military experience before the the English Civil War. He did this translation of New Philosophical Furnaces in 1651. Here's the date here. That's the date that he translated it. It gets published in 1652. The other books that he translated are um, listed on that last back page, but their dates are 67, 74, 74, and 74. These three are three separate books written by uh, Paracelsus, but translated by John French and bound together. These three 
I have a copy of these three from 1674. This is what I use as a benchmark to check the authenticity of this 1651 paper in stuff like that. He also, this JF, also appears to be a person who, during uh, the period just before Cromwell becomes the Lord Protector of the Commonwealth, writes a petition to Cromwell in 1653. This petition is extremely interesting to me. He addresses Cromwell both in a military title and familiar as if they had worked together. Then he goes on to say, I don't know if you're aware of the poor state of our veterans from our previous wars. We need to do something to help take care of them. And I have a scheme. Please entertain my suggestions. It doesn't tell what the scheme is. But in 1653, one possibility is this book represents part of that scheme. It fits between, it's after the date that this is published, it's before Cromwell takes over as Lord Protector, and it matches the date of Cromwell's signature in the front of the book. The 1653 date. Now let's dig into some of the odd notes. Everything that I've said up until now, I'm based on the hypothesis that this is an authentic book. There may be some fixes done later to repair the appearance of the book, like the binding. And there may be some other little quirky things about it. But basically, it's authentic. Now let's get skeptical. Starting in the 1980s, new people are looking at this, looking at these signatures and saying, you know what? These look too much like that. If I was a forger, I would use this highly recognized signature of Cromwell and copy it if I'm going to forge Cromwell's signature. Based on that kind of analysis, recent authorities on forgeries have declared this book to be a forgery. This is probably not Cromwell's copy, according to them. And that's what the uh, guy who sold it to me told me. The other thing that they point to is this language. May the Lord help me in my pious undertaking. Does this sound Cromwellian or does this sound like Shakespeare? Well, people who want to dismiss it say, eh, you know, this sounds really like Shakespeare again. Sounds like somebody from the 1800 went back to publish accounts from that period and tried to copy the language, the syntax. In particular, they point out this phrase, an errant name, is used in Shakespeare something like 17 times. They say, this is a fake. They're using Shakespeare as a point of reference for 17th century language. The second thing that they point to is, here's Glauber's furnaces, Cromwell's death. If Cromwell owned a copy of this, what happened during these almost 200 years when we have no record of where the book was, who owned it, what was going on. We get these letters in 1860 and 1876 that say that it was authentic. We also have a previous owner, the guy who offered it for sale in 1876, claims that his father bought this copy of the book somewhere around 1840 and has had it in his library since and it was claimed to be authentic at that time. Even if we accept this claim, there's still 200 years missing. We've got to figure out where this book might have been for 200 years. It's got this disputed authenticity, and in 2001, Christie's Auction House auctioned it off only as a forged copy. They doubted even the authenticity of the text itself because it was so mangled and, and modified. 
At this point, I discovered that my study of this book had gone from alchemy through history, and now I'm going to have to understand the history of forgery, and particularly the forgery of uh, documents in British history related to Oliver Cromwell, or at least that period. In there, one of the famous ones, I don't know if anybody else has heard of this, but it turns out amongst, among uh, forgers, these squire papers are quite famous. There are 36 unpublished letters and notes from Oliver Cromwell. They were authenticated by Thomas Carlyle in 1847. Whole lot of publicity around them. Now, I've gone through these squire papers. Some of them are really trite little scraps of paper saying, so-and-so was working for me, and yes, we should repay his debt of so many pounds. There's little notes. Um, around 1920, they started looking at them and recognized these are all forged. These are all completely forged in the 1840s. In the 1840s. About the time that this book was acquired by the guy who auctioned it in 1870. So that kind of fits with the forgery pattern. The other example of forgeries is this guy, Alexander Howland Smith, who is so famous among forgers that his nickname is Antique Smith. He worked in Edinburgh, and he was active in the 1880s and 90s. And what he would do is he would go to Edinburgh and go through the bookstores and the libraries and the universities, and he would buy up old books, any old book. He didn't care what the book was about, as long as it had one condition. It had to have blank pages. And then what he did was he ripped out the blank pages, because now he's got old paper. He threw the book away, and he forged letters on the blank paper, showing that the old paper was authentic, and sold them as letters from all kinds of people. Um, I love this. The forgeries were unbelievably clumsy. Unbelievably clumsy. Uh, one of them claims to be a letter from Napoleon written in English. <laughs> I'm not even sure Napoleon knew English. Um, there's a, a, a number of them. They're just crazy. Just absolutely crazy, bizarre stuff. In 1893, he was convicted of forgery and spent a year in prison. And among the evidence that was held against him was forgery of letters from Cromwell and a bunch of other people. So there's lots of possibilities, and lots of examples of things that could have been forged by Cromwell. So now we come back to the book. If we assume it's a forgery, why are there three signatures in it? If you're going to forge a signature, I don't know how a forger thinks, but if I were going to forge a signature, I want to reduce, reduce my exposure. I'm not going to do three signatures, two quotes, and a map. I'm going to do one signature, possibly an abbreviated signature, and I'm going to make it as short as possible. Why all of this content? And the dating, if you're a forger, you have to know almost day by day what Oliver Cromwell was doing in the first half of the year 1653. And you have to know when he had access to information and when he didn't have access to information and recognize that once he became Lord Protector, he stopped signing his name Oliver Cromwell. He signed it Oliver P. Protector. So all of this says God, if you're going to forge this, this is way too much work for a quick forgery. On the other hand, this map in 1840 is close to the anniversary date of the Battle of Nasty. That map alone might make it really, really valuable. But if you're going to forge the map, you probably don't need the quotes and this probably don't need three signatures. One would be enough. And if you're going to forge it, 
Why not just do what Antique Smith did? Rip out the blank page, put the forgery on that, and sell it alone. Why bury it in an alchemy book? What is the purpose of that? I can't come up with any reasonable explanation. I have tried, and all I've gotten is a headache. Why all the extra marginal notes? Why all these extra marginal notes? Why all the underlining? The underlining, I think, is probably authentic. The stains are probably authentic. That piece of, of laboratory equipment is probably authentic. That's of interest to me, even if the Cromwell signatures are forged. And then there's this signature that looks like it's Glauber's that nobody seems to mention when they give a history of this book. And I'm not sure what to make of that. Ah, there it is. Here, on the bottom of one of the title pages, Johann Rudolf Glauber, 1652. Why is this here? Or is this maybe a librarian's note from some later date? I don't know. I haven't found an authentic um, signature of Glauber to compare this to. It appears just opposite the blank page with the Cromwell, the map, and the quote. What's up with all of that? I don't know what to make of it. But if I go back to the hypothesis that this is authentic, this might be a presentation copy. This is the fourth part of the book. These weren't originally bound together. This was several sections, like a series of books. This might be a, um, a presentation copy that John French got Glauber to sign, saying, I'm going to give a copy of your book to Cromwell. He's an important person in the upcoming government. That's not unreasonable. So if it's really, uh, the things that are going for it to be authentic, it's heavily repaired. Part of the reason that it's heavily repaired is that through the years, people thought it was authentic. It was rebound in the late 1800s and given this really nice slip case. I would love to get it into a forensics lab to look at ink quality from 1850 or 1650. I expect those to be really different. <coughs> we should be able to distinguish those. If the ink is from 1850, well, we know it's not Oliver Cromwell's. This reports of uh, the book between 1670 and 1870. Anything. Anything. Somebody to just mention it, or at least figure out where it was. And what was the basis of it being declared a forgery between 1870 and 2001. This looks like it's largely based on penmanship analysis. One of the things to keep in mind, if you owned a book with Oliver Cromwell's signature in it in the 1670s, after the Restoration, this was not a popular thing to own. And uh, there's a recent book out that details that after the Restoration, Charles II took the, took the execution of his father very seriously and personally. And he made it a state effort to send people out and have everybody that signed that death warrant executed. Didn't matter where they were. People in hiding in France were mysteriously executed. People in hiding in Switzerland under state protection were executed. If you own a book with three signatures of Cromwell in it, you probably didn't want anybody to know about it. It was probably not safe for um, a good 100 years, probably 200. It wasn't until the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Nasby that Cromwell comes back into any popularity in the UK. Um, if you look at published reports, published books or articles about Oliver Cromwell in uh, English between 1670 and 1870, 
At the time of the Civil War, it goes way up because he's involved in politics. After the Restoration, it goes way down. It stays down for about 100 years. Starting about 1770, 1790, 1800, it starts creeping up again until it hits the bicentennial around 1840. And by 1870, they're publishing new biographies of him. He's a big popular guy. Notice 1870 is when it goes up for auction again. 1840 it first appears, 1870 it's up for auction. And the portrait we talked about. Are there multiple copies? This is still, this still drives me crazy when I think about it. When Christie's listed for auction in 2001, they give a very detailed description of the book. Some leaves are torn with losses. They mean losses to the text. This copy doesn't have any lost text. But it does have tipped in pages. Maybe the tipped in pages came from an original, or maybe there's two copies. It, uh, this red Morocco slipcase, with the upper cover missing and the lower board detached and the spine broken. Well, the red Morocco slipcase that this one comes in is undamaged. It is repaired. One of the things that I did get squeezed out of the guy who sold it to me is the top case was broken. And he repaired it. He did an excellent repair. But it is repaired. It's not missing. Not quite sure what that's telling us. And nowhere did it say anything about explaining the Glover signature. It does explain three Cromwell signatures, one date, two quotes, the map, all that other stuff is in there, but it doesn't mention this. One of the things, if this is a unique artifact, there should only be one of them. If there's two, there can't be two authentic ones. One of them would probably be a forgery of the other one. That hasn't been eliminated. I don't know how we would eliminate that exactly. We could eliminate it as a unique copy if we find a second. But if we never find a second, we don't know that it didn't exist at some point. Ah. Um, the reference librarians of the world. All reference librarians are magnificent. I don't care who they are. You walk into a library, you go to the reference desk, and you say, I'm looking for something, and I've got nothing to go on. They find it for you. <laughs> Just amazing people. Uh, Liz spent, I spent years trying to research this. Liz spent, she tells me, five hours and found more stuff in five hours than I had found in the previous two years. I found most of the information in the first two years. The second two years, I kept coming up trying. She found all kinds of cool stuff. Um, with that, my presentation is done. We'll come back to this. I'm ready to entertain any questions you've got. Um, any suggestions? Anybody that knows of a forensic lab that specializes in inks in the 16 to 1700s, 1600s, 1800s, I'd be happy to know. Is there, um, any, is there any paper trail from the Christie's auction to the seller to you? Oh, from uh, 1876, from the 1876 auction, which is not Christie's, we've got a continuous record from there to today. We know exactly who we Some of it is owned by an unidentified owner, that bought it at one point and then sold it at another. But we know that it's the same book from there to here. From 2001, we're very sure, certain of who owned it. It was basically Christie's offered it for auction. The dealer that I bought it from bought it, and I bought it from him. So that's very short list. So is, I, I think what the gentleman was maybe asking, is there any way to find out who owns this other copy so that you could get comparisons? I don't know. I was just wondering if... The um, hard part yeah. is most of the records claim that there's only one copy. Yeah. It must be interesting to, co to contact Christie's, though, and see if there's any way they put you in contact, or, or at least pass your information along to the, the, the one that purchased it in 2001. And, and oh, I know who bought it in 2001. The guy that I bought it? Okay. So We're talking about it. Same copy. Yeah. It's just, we know that that's the same artifact. How much did it sell for in 2001? 
I don't know how much it sold for in 2001, but I know I paid a lot more when I bought it in 2013. So is this is Christie's like the, the gateway if you can convince Christie's to authenticate it? Is that kind of the, the group that does that? Say more? So is this whole trying, are you trying to get Christie's, like kind of persuade Christie's to authenticate it at some point? Are they kind of the gateway? Um, their authentication relies entirely on the penmanship analysis that the signatures are forged. They don't care about the authenticity of the book. I care more about the authenticity of the book. Remember, if there were no Cromwell signatures in it, I would have bought this book anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of weird. So the that, reference librarian in the back. That's Christie's description. The guy you bought it from bought it based off that description. So he knew it was a portrait when he bought it. Well, how did, by the time he sold it to you, how did it change so drastically? Kind of. The only part that changed drastically is this. And he said he repaired it. And he said he repaired it. So he had it rebound too. Um, this is referring to the slip case. He didn't rebind the book. The book looks like it's rebound in about the 1800s. But okay. there's no losses in your book. Yeah, this question about losses, um, where there's some torn leaves with losses, if you look at that first page, there are lost pieces of paper, but not lost text. If you're looking for a first edition, pristine copy, this is not the copy you want. So Christie's is auctioning it both as a forgery and as a first edition article. So commonly, losses would mean text but not exclusively. It depends who you're selling to. Okay. Christie's wants to sell pristine first editions. The, the page that, had, that was covered over, that you know, had the sentence that was kind of blocked over, have you tried to look at that with any alternate light? Yeah. And, and you can't, still can't read through it's it? It's smeared pretty bad. Yeah. It could be that it was smeared as soon as it was written. Right. It could be that it was never dry. So the, the Tipton pages, were those actual replacement pages, the ones that were missing? That's what could be this torn with losses. Could be that one of the Tipton, at least one of the Tipton pages is in the text. And the Tipton page is not the 1650 edition. It's from a, a later edition, later printing. This book went through a lot of, this English translation went through a lot of reprinting over the next few decades. What, what language was it originally written in, I'm sorry? Uh, originally in Latin. Latin. In Latin with some uh, Dutch and German parts to it. Because remember, he's from Bavaria, lived in Amsterdam. Um, when you're writing a modern technical treatise, as he was writing in 1650, um, there aren't Latin words for what you're trying to describe. So I haven't looked at the Latin version, but my understanding, what I've been told is that he'll be going along in Latin and then he breaks into German for a while. And then he goes along in Latin and he breaks into Dutch for a while. It's kind of based. People who are looking at the original text use that to break down when he wrote each part of it. And some of it was written in Bavaria. Some of it was written in Amsterdam. Do you think the Tipton pages may have been added in to replace broken leaves when it was rebound? Yeah, the question is when. The only question is when. But what does that say about this Cromwell ownership? Not much. Not much. Odd stuff. What's your gut tell me? What's my gut tell me? Which day of the week is it? <laughs> you know? Um, it's really kind of bizarre. On the one hand, I, I just love the book for the content of the chemistry of the time. Other times I pick it up and go, man, this would be really cool if Oliver Cromwell had owned this. And then there are other times I say, even if he didn't own this, 
if this is a forgery, the story of the forgery is more interesting than if it's authentic. If it's authentic, okay, Cromwell owned it for two months. He signed it. He stuck it in a closet. He died. People hid it. It was hidden for 200 years, went through multiple generations in a family. They survived. They sold it in 1840. It's a boring story. But if it's forged, why, why did he pick this book? Why did he do it this way? Why so many? And that date too. Why did he pick it at the very end? Why did he get the dates the way that he did? Why is there three signatures? What the hell is with the two quotes? Why bother with the map? If you're going to do the map, do the map on a page this big, you know? Like it might have been real. On the other hand, if it is authentic, what's up with the map? Could he have made it before why? seeing the battlefield, maybe? Say it again? Maybe he could have written it before seeing the battlefield up close. Well, if it's a forgery, that would explain it. That's an easy way to explain it if it's a portrait. If it's an authentic map, if Cromwell really did draw it, why is he drawing this little map that's about two inches on a side on the back of a chemistry book years after the battle? What the hell? Well, it turns out that right about 1653, Cromwell was called up before Parliament for um, claims that he botched the Civil War. And it all pivoted on this Battle of Nazareth. He beat down those claims and then, you know, threw them over through the government. But Maybe you, you get into all that. those little political machinations. Oh my God, what is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really bizarre. <laughs> it's like me right in the back of an envelope. You know? <laughs> Why am I going to go with the strike and I'm going to yeah. see? <laughs> Any possibility Antique Smith did the forgeries and he totally was very clumsy? Um, Antique Smith is too late. The squire, whoever did the squire papers, is a possibility. This is about the same time that this book first appears. This is 1890s and he made no attempt to make his Oliver Cromwell signatures look like Oliver Cromwell's signatures. He just signed Oliver Cromwell. Some forgers are so famous, even though their work's collectible or something. Yeah, the weird part is, <laughs> as forgeries, they're highly collectible. <laughs> so in a way, the fact that this is not clear whether it's original or a forgery is keeping the price depressed. If it were a forgery, we'd know who did it, and it would be worth something. If it's original, we'd know who did it, it would be worth something. It's the in-between that's, that's uh, well, keeping it marginally depressed. Is there anything in the content that would have helped with people coming back from a war? The Trump, Trump oh, Trump so. Trump. Thank you for bringing that up. The question is, <laughs> is there anything in the content of this book that would um, aid the veterans, aids and all of this stuff. Um, this book, if you think just before this, late 1500s, early 1600s, uh, there was basically two kinds of medicine, herbalists and surgeons. You put powdered plants on it or you cut it off. The beginning of this alchemy stuff, this is when they're starting to distill off spirits. They're trying to make extracts. Some of the things that we think of as just uh, happy drinks, like gin, originally were developed as medicinals. Um, uh, gin certainly was one, um, who was the other one? The, uh, not chartreuse, the, well, chartreuse was one. Most of those old distilled spirits that trace their ancestry back to the 1600s, they were originally a medicinal. And, uh, you know, if you drink enough 80 proof, uh, 40 proof alcohol, you feel better. Um, so, absinthe, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yes, it's supposed to be able to cure just about anything until people start dying from it. So it wasn't about the employing them or retraining them, it was about helping them physically. It was about curing them, yeah, it was about helping them. Um, curiously, that claim is made by the translator not by the author. It's made by the translator on behalf of the author. 
the author was just trying to back up the sales of the spirits themselves that he was preparing in Amsterdam. What I'd love to find would be a, uh, not so much related to this particular copy, but to the book in general, is I would like to find an advertisement flyer from Amsterdam for Glauber's Apothecary. I haven't found it yet. I don't even know that it exists. Is there any connection between JF's history of interested in alchemy? Or? JF in alchemy? Yeah. Yeah, he translated six books. Well, he, but he, beyond the translation aspect. Beyond the translation, he disappears in history. We don't know exactly even when he died. He would have kept a copy of something he translated had Glauber signed it for him. And if he was friends with Rockwell, All Rockwell. kinds of things that, I mean, once you go off into the yeah. hypothetical world, you can yeah. spread yeah. out yeah. all yeah. kinds yeah. of stories yeah. from the world. Yeah. Yep. We know that J.F. went back and forth from London to Amsterdam at a time that he could have met Glauber in Amsterdam. Right. But we don't have any and notes that like say, he hey, we got together. He never did a little map that you can compare. Hmm. I nope. wouldn't give my own copy away. I've made another copy before I gave it off to somebody who even called up. I don't know. All bets are off, right? I keep going back to the three signatures. I kind of have a theory why Oliver Conwell would sign on three separate occasions and all of them. They look similar, but they're. they're so, the, why do you sign? If it were authentic, why would you sign on three? If they're not bound together, they're three separate books that go together. Oh. And the signatures are on the title or the end plate of three separate oh. signatures, oh. three uh, book signatures. So it kind of makes sense, not much, but a little. Yeah, that's probably kind of quirky stuff. Authenticating a book back then, just to say it's book. Yeah, it's weird. So, um, do we want to bring up the lights? <laughs> Uh, Tyler made a wonderful suggestion. He said if you want to know more about the book, then take it to Vegas Pawn Stars, and they'll tell you all about it in 20 minutes. <laughs> um, the, uh, the book itself is here. This is the red Morocco slipcase, blah, 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 blah. The uh, little book of the documents is here, so the letters are actually in here. Um, this is the, uh, the book itself. Um, you can see the pages, and here's the stains, and uh, wormholes are here for everybody to see. It's, uh, the rebinding is a really great 18th century rebind, uh, 19th century, 1800s rebinding. Uh, I have other books from the 1650s, 1670s, they don't look anywhere near this. So you don't have much doubt that it was an original printing of the actual book. Is this that part, I, yeah, these pages I think are original. They've been trimmed down with the rebinding. You can see the margins used to be larger, the top is pretty much gone. The text is all there. Whoever did it did a careful job. But anybody who's interested, it's here for all to see. Well, that somebody was using that book, so that's interesting too, because who would have been the person using the book? Yeah, somebody used it. <coughs> if it was a 1653 presentation copy to Cromwell, I don't think he was using it. No. no. But well, when was it used? Was it used after that? That fits with the hypothesis that it's forged. Somebody used it in the 1650s or 60s, then it sat on a shelf for 100 or 200 years, and then somebody found it on the shelf and used it to forge the signatures. So why would you pick Cromwell? But that's what I don't why pick Cromwell? Why put three Cromwell signatures in the same book? Why not put them in three different books and sell them as a set? Because it was increasing the popularity then. Yeah, and it has to be at a time when Cromwell's popularity was going up, not when it was going down. So it had to sit around for quite a while before it got picked up. But, Antique Smith in the 1890s did just exactly that for 15 years. I think it sat around in three different pieces and somebody put it together. It could have sat around in many different pieces. That's what it could have. And the, the other thing, this title page, 
Um, if you compare the title page to the other pages, I think this clearly came from another copy of the book. I think this was originally lost. So I got folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.